Thank you all for coming, but let me say at the outset, Dr. Harden, Vincent Harden, my very good friend for 55 years or so, he said to me, I don't give speeches, I like to interact with people and have discussions. So let me say to those of you who are sitting in the back, if you don't mind coming down closer, I will assure you we will not open the doors of the church <laughs> and we will not take up a collection. So please feel free to come down front. Let me tell you just a little bit about our guest for today. I've known Dr. Harding since the early 60s and he came to Albany in 1961 at the height of the Albany Civil Rights Movement. And he, like others who came there to join in the movement, whether you came by bus or train or you drove in or you walked in, however you got there, and you would stop and ask, where's the movement? They would all be directed to my home. <laughs> so when Vincent came and asked for directions, where's the movement? He wound up at my home. And he stayed for months on end like two doors from where I lived on Cedar Avenue. And that house is still there, by the way, Vince. It's still standing. I took Rhea down there so she can see how I live. It was a wonderful home. I was there with my two children. We had one while we were there. And Vince became a part of the movement. He did not come there to give a speech and leave. He came there to be part of the movement. We had mass meetings literally every night and went to jail literally every day. And in between, we had strategy meetings. Whatever was going on, Vince was there. I don't know how many people we fed, Vince, in my house. You know, my house was always full. And there was always somebody either eating or sleeping or doing something there. And somehow we managed to accommodate them. And there were literally hundreds of people that came through my home during this era. But if you were committed to the cause, you paid little attention to the conditions under which you had to exist. Not like those people on that ship, and I understand that ship is going to make it in the mobile, but I think the ship line has made them a magnanimous offer, Dean. They say, you will not have to pay for this trip, and we'll give you a 25% discount on our next trip. <laughs> so I asked Rhea, I said, what would you say in response to that? I said, I'll tell them what to do with that 25%. But anyway, uh, uh, Dr. Harden, he hails from Harlem, New York, and he went to City College. He had his first degree, his bachelor's degree in history. Later on, he got a master's in journalism. He is a minister, he's an educator, he's an author, he's an organizer, he's a motivator, a prolific writer, and he was married to Rose Marie. And let me say that about Rose Marie, because she was right with him. We did not exclude women in the Albany movement, the civil rights movement. There were many females who were, in fact, leaders in the civil rights movement. And his, Rose, his late wife was right there along with him throughout the period of time that he was there. So we miss her. He first joined with Martin Luther King in Atlanta, and he joined them with SNCC. Now, mind you, Vince is almost as old as me. SNCC was a student nonviolent coordinator committee that was made up of children. These were, these were children. I mean, they were primarily college kids or college kids that had dropped out or high school kids. But students were the ones who led the movement. Vince, I'm not sure there would have been a movement had that not been for students. But the students who are here, let me thank you for what you did 50 years ago here. Because had it not been for the students involved, there would not have been a successful movement, whether it be in Birmingham or whether it be in Montgomery or whether it be in Albany or anywhere else. They were important to the movement. So Vincent and I joined the students. Another thing that I learned about him, in addition to him being a prolific writer and motivator and educator, he liked to engage people to get their ideas and thoughts. How are they thinking? What motivates them to want to continue this movement toward justice and equality. So I'm very happy to be a friend of him, of his. I'm very happy that he accepted the invitation when I gave him a call 
because it was as though we had been in constant contact. When I called and said, Vince, I want you to do so and so, I'd be glad to do it. And he's here for us. So today, he is the, he's the Professor Emeritus of Religion and Social Transformation at the, I guess this is a school in theology in Denver. That's where I found him. And uh, visiting distinguished professor in African American religion at Drew University. And that was before he went out to Colorado. And he's taught at a number of colleges and universities throughout the nation. So I am honored, and you will be honored, to be in his presence for the rest of the afternoon. So without further ado, let me present to you my friend, Vincent Harding. Vince Harding. Thank you, my dear brother Andy. Andy, I noticed, was trying to do something that I'm going to continue trying to do. This day has been so rich for me because I've been involved in conversation with all kinds of wonderful folks at every age level that I can imagine, and we have been in dialogue with one another. And I am always deeply empowered through dialogue, not through giving speeches, but through engaging with other people. Andy, at the beginning, was saying to you, come on closer so that we can have a real engagement. I want to continue that invitation. Come as close as you can so that I can see you even more than I can see you now. You see, this setup is not a democratic setup. <laughs> it's set up so that you can sit in the dark and look at us in the light. In democracy, everybody should be in the light looking at each other, hearing each other, seeing how beautiful each other is, and moving forward together. If you have the capacity, come on closer, would you? Just almost as an act of affirmation of the democratic responsibility to share with one another. I will give you at least three minutes to come closer, thank you, thank you. Anybody who wants to come even closer, keep coming closer. You're doing wonderfully, wonderfully well. Thank you, keep coming. One of the great women of the 20th century made this statement that continues to be a great source of inspiration to me. She said, it is when we are in dialogue that we are most human. Not when we are making speeches to one another, but when we are in dialogue with each other. And as I said just a few minutes ago, I have been very, very enthused about the conversation that we've been able to have up to now, those of you who have been part of the community settings in which I have been participating today since breakfast time. And it's just been rich for me. I want to add that I've been very glad to be here to see my brother Andy, who, as he mentioned, has been my friend and brother since 1961, a long, long time. That, by the way, is one of the characteristics of any deeply human movement for the transformation of a society. The people who participate in it build grounds of relationship that go on and on for a long, long time. 
And so I would want to encourage those of you who are younger, if you are looking for the building of grounds that will carry you for a half century, you can try it with being a part of a football discussion group, but it's even more likely that you will build for a half century if you are standing with sisters and brothers who are trying to create a new society. I'm glad to be here with him and glad to hear that he is going to be honored tomorrow for what I would call his service to his country. Now, in America today, when we use that term, serving our country, we usually mean military service. But it is so important to be reminded that there are many other ways to serve our country than going to kill and be killed someplace else. Right here. Right here, someone has been serving his country by opening new possibilities for a democratic society to become rich and strong and multiply in its great diversity. So Andy, thank you for staying, for continuing, for building, and for setting a wonderful example to these young folks here. This morning, the dialogue among us began with my reflecting on last Tuesday's State of the Union address. I am curious how many of you heard that or saw that while it was going on. Can I see your hands? Okay. I would be curious even more so if I could hear from those of you who raised your hands and from some of you who did not raise your hands. Here is what I'd like to know. In the midst of the American society, which says that we are all the people of this society, and the prologue to the Constitution says we the people of the United States, not the president, but we the people of the United States, have as our major responsibility the building of a more perfect union. In the light of that, tell me a little bit, please, about what you heard from the president during the State of the Union what, if you were watching television, you saw in that setting of the Congress of the United States, what stays on your mind for one reason or another about that State of the Union address and that State of the Union setting? What still is with you as you're thinking about that? And our servant of the people is here with the camera, with the uh, mic, so that he can be a help to you to let your voice be heard. What's on your mind as you think of that State of the Union address? I'd like to hear that as well as if anybody wants to ask, tell me, tell us why you didn't listen to or watch the State of the Union address. Either one of those would 
enlightened me a great deal, and as I understand it, part of the reason why we live as human beings, and certainly as citizens, is to enlighten each other. And so you can enlighten me if you share some of what struck you as important, and also if some of you will say why you didn't think it was important enough for you to be a part of it. Could I begin to see some hands and let me indicate to you that, and this is not to stop you, my brother, but let me say that I would like to privilege in this conversation everyone who is under 35, okay? So let's just go, go from there. Please. I don't think I count. For okay, here is another thing that you've got to deal with, with this strange person who is simply in love with the possibilities of democracy, okay? I would like you to start off your engagement in the process by telling me your full name, because I believe very much that democracy and anonymity don't go together, and that it's so important for us to know who we are in conversation with each other, even a little bit. Your full name, where you spent your childhood, and <laughs> your mama's mama's name, <laughs> and where she spent her childhood. And finally, what are you doing here in East Lansing, Mississippi? Mississippi. <laughs> Michigan. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Mississippi. By the way, if there had been no Mississippi struggle, there would be no Barack Obama. So remember that. Remember that. Please, friend. Um, my name is Patrick Rose, and I'm not under 35. Um, it's all right. We will forgive you. <laughs> um, my, my mother's name is Grace Rose, and I grew up in Flint, Michigan, okay. um, about a mile from a factory. And uh, my first job was at B. Patterson's Ice Cream Store, where every president ate ice cream within <laughs> a week of the election, all the way up through Jimmy Carter. Okay, so we have you to blame for this, is that right? <laughs> okay. Uh, my, my grandmother's name is Caroline Russell, and she grew up in Calumet, Michigan, where she came off a ship after many of her siblings died. Mm. in poverty, and they came over, and the only reason... Came over from where, my friend? From, um, from uh, a mining town on the coast of England. Okay. Um, and the only reason her father didn't go down into the pit where three out of five either died or got very sick is because he had been tutored in English, and so he mm. ran the elevator and stayed at the top. Mm. It's a fact, so... Um, I, I worked very hard to elect Barack Obama. I shut down my law practice for seven months. I raised money to fund litigation. I worked in nine states doing election cases, including one in the U.S. Supreme Court, um, to get voters able to vote. Um, before the State of the Union, I was working on a brief for the Second Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals to support the New York Times and the ACLU suit to disclose the names of, um, of the targeted people for the drone strikes and all the information that led to their deaths. And it included the three Americans killed, including an American whose son was killed um, in a later strike. And the purpose of the lawsuit was to find out why in secret the president was ordering the deaths of Americans and refusing to tell a court that he could honor the promises he'd made in speeches in the White House regarding the fact that he had evidence that they were planning imminent attacks. Now tell me your first name again. Is it Peter? Was it Peter? Patrick. Patrick, okay. Um, and just before I watched it, the night before, I had seen a, a talk by Medea Benjamin, who went to Pakistan on the ground and interviewed 31 families who all lost their children and who had Googled uh, John Brennan's um, home address and gone to his front porch and talked to him personally on a Saturday morning and said, would you investigate the deaths of these 31 children? And he said, you're being given misinformation. And she said, no, we have transcripts of our interviews. Here, I'll give you three cases in particular, but 
they are owed an apology, they are owed reparations, and you need to learn why you made the mistake of killing all these kids. We think there are as many as 3,000 documented victims and as many as 13,000 total, all innocent civilians, but we just want you to look at these 31 kids. He promised that he would, that was in November. John Brennan was in the room when the president signed the death warrants of these, of these targets that didn't include the 31 kids, but John Brennan said to Medea Benjamin, they deserve an apology if they in fact were killed by a drone, they deserve reparations. And he has not gotten back to her. They were in the room when he was up to be confirmed for CAA chief, they had the names of the 31, and they were removed from the room, and the room was sealed. Patrick, um, now you were going to respond about the State of the Union address. And, and my response is that I listened carefully, mm. and I didn't hear the word drone. Mm. And I heard seven or eight references that were all coded references to drones. Yes. And it was about drones making us safe. It was about drones instead of troops. It was about drones allowing us to continue wars without troops on the ground. And then I read the Pew studies that show that there are 60 or 70 or even 82% as many as 82%, and that includes good Democrats, good Republicans, good independents, all races, all income groups who support this policy of secret killings with no attempt to find out who the victims are when we signed a court that said we have to investigate innocent civilians who are killed. We have an absolute obligation under treaties we've signed to investigate innocent victims we've killed. And I just wonder how you create a movement around that when the vast majority of Americans seem to be perfectly happy with what's going on and the president seems to be perfectly happy talking about it in code and never actually openly discussing it, sealing the room when the guy who's the architect of the policy talks about it. And I was across the street with seven federal judges and the man who wrote the rules, who was the head of counterterrorism worldwide, who comes from Michigan, and he gave a talk about this where he was talking about Anwar Awlaki's lawsuit. And he was talking about why he shouldn't be allowed to get court review, and this was before they killed him and his son. And then we had a talk by the man who challenged the Guantanamo detainees suits in the US Supreme Court and won all five, where they were trying in secret to torture and detain people endlessly. They lost all five cases. And in that room, of all the lawyers, many of whom I've known my whole career, which is 25 years as a lawyer, there wasn't one shocked person. There wasn't one person who thought anything was wrong. Patrick, let me, let me just ask you to hold for a moment. And may I ask those of you who are listening to Patrick to recognize that what he represents is something that, thank God, has been in this country all through its life people who will not accept what is expected to be accepted by everybody. Always there have been people who say, no, that's not right, starting with, no, there should not be slavery in a democratic society. And Patrick reminds me of all the people from those days who would not be shut up when people said, you're talking too much about this business of slavery. Patrick is following a powerful American tradition, which I personally suspect must be encouraged and joined if America is to have a human future. So I'm hoping that we will listen to Patrick and maybe those of us who catch him before he leaves from here and can say to him some things about all that we don't know and try to find out all the things that he does know that we may add something like this to our education that this is an educational process. But Patrick, I'm gonna ask you to now turn it towards your closing for us with great thanks for your lifting up the problem that you saw in the State of the Union address. Thank you very much.
may I suggest that, by the way, we do allow women to speak too, <laughs> okay? May I suggest that we think hard about this matter of the ways in which you can get education outside of the classrooms and try to figure out how we can have more and more of these kinds of situations where we will learn from each other by agreeing or disagreeing with each other and ultimately how we can ask ourselves and what can I do about this in addition to applauding Patrick? What is my role as a citizen of the United States of America? You were going to say something about the State of the Union? Yes. Please. My name is Freya Anderson Rivers, and I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the home of the first bus boycott, successful bus boycott of the Civil Rights Movement. And tell us your name again. Freya. Freya. Anderson F -R -E -Y -A? Rivers. F-R-E-Y-A? Correct. All right. Thank you very much, Sister Freya. What were you going to say about this matter of the State of the Union? I was very taken aback by the polarization that still exists. I was hoping that by the second term and by the overwhelming majority that our president was reelected with, that we would see more of a coming together of Congress. But as I sat there and watched, the Democrats were still applauding and giving standing ovations and the Republicans were still sitting and cutting their eyes. And for even for our democracy to endure uh, making it a more perfect union, when he said things like early childhood education and better education for all students and helping those to go to college, uh, gun control, even with these kinds of issues, that polarization still exists. So I'm still amazed at there won't be a change for the next four years in Congress. What will we be able to accomplish? And I still think that the bottom line of all of this is racism. All right. Sister Freya, may I suggest that there's a bottom line that goes beneath that line, and that bottom line is that none of this can change unless we, the people of the United States, find our role in working for change, because as you saw, we obviously cannot depend upon the Congress that we know now. What then is our role as we the people who send people to represent us? What do we do? My sense is that part of what we must do is keep coming together like this and trying to figure it out together. What's our job? What's our role? What's our responsibility? But thank you for what you had to say about what you saw, what you shared there. Anything that others want to say to that qu those questions of mine about the State of the Union and what seemed important to you as you were watching or listening uh, to the State of the Union? I'm going to kind of cheat here, which I did getting, no, it'll only take one second. I would like to speak later to a pressing issue. Before you do that, could you identify yourself, please? <laughs> oh, I don't want to do that. Yes, I will. My name is Suzanne Elms Barclay, and there's a critical issue brought up in the Lansing State Journal about the cost of black dolls versus white dolls that I got very involved in. And I wanted, this is an extraordinary audience to take that, but I'm, I'm gonna back up. I just want to have some time later because I, okay. I think this is an extraordinary situation because I've been told several times by white people today that whites should just forget about race and I'm mm -hmm. not about to. Okay, thank you. And so you're asking for some time. You're putting in a bid for some time before we finish, okay? And then you'll tell us your name too, right? Okay. If you tell me to stop 
doing what I do about race, I will continue to do it. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to stop doing anything. You are part of we the people of the United States. And so let's just see where that takes us. Did somebody else want to say anything? Right here. Again, you see, this is not built for democratic engagement because I have to look and figure out Hello? what's going Hello? on here. Can you now hear me? you are here. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for your patience. No problem. My name is Leona McElveen. Um, I was born in Detroit, Michigan, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, my mother was born in Florence, South Carolina. Your mom, how about your mama's mama? My mother's mother was born in South Carolina okay. as well, as far as I know. Good. Yeah, as far as I know. And in terms of the State of the Union address, uh, a number of things popped out to me. But briefly, I'll just say I, I saw an excellent orator. I thought that uh, the president is, a, is an excellent speaker. And I saw a man who's easy on the eyes. That doesn't hurt that he's handsome. <laughs> and <laughs> However, uh, like Patrick, you know, I was aware of uh, innocent children being killed with drones. And uh, also, when he did the, 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 the sequence in his speech about... Um, the vote? Right, right, yeah. Sandy Hook, parents need a vote. Uh, the young lady who was just shot in Chicago need a vote. And, um, you know, when he, it was very... Uh, you know, emotional and well done, and, and some truth to it. However, it seemed a bit hypocritical to me. And then the other part of it is... Um, what seemed hypocritical, by the way? Well, the fact that uh, the president was talking about um, gun, gun control and, and controlling violence, whereas as, as uh, I think Dr. King said it in, in your speech, how the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. I don't know that that's changed. Um, and that's th why we need you, Sister Leona, to keep speaking and keep acting. Mm hmm okay. The other thing, thank you. I, I, the other thing I saw, this was something I saw on Facebook. I'll just share this briefly. Uh, it was a photo of Christopher Donner, the late Christopher Donner, and uh, President Barack Obama, side by side. Mm. And, and the lettering was, uh, Christopher Donner had a kill list. He uh, probably illegally killed some people. And uh, his result was getting burned alive. Whereas the president, he, had, he also has a kill list. And as uh, far as I know, he's been, you know, he's, he's ordered illegal killings of innocents. And uh, he's gotten a Nobel P Peace Prize as a result. So that's yeah. all I have to share right now. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for keeping that question open. Remember, our dear brother Martin Luther King said, this country will never become the country it could be until it deals with what he referred to as the great triple evils of racism, of materialism, and of militarism. So you are speaking in a great tradition there, and I'm very glad that you lifted that up from the State of the Union, and I hope that you will find others to work with you to know how we can take that critique from simply being a verbal critique to becoming a source of action for us to figure out what do we the people now do in the light of these things. Like to hear some more from you. You wanted to say something else, was that it? No, I wanted to add something else, if it's okay. Of course it's okay, you are the people. <laughs> I, I wanted to um, kind of like piggyback on what the sister over here said about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, 
the animosity, well, these weren't her words, but the animosity against the president seeming like it's racism. I, I, think, that's, I, th I think that's true. However, I think it's, I think it's truer to uh, talk about white supremacy versus racism. You know, the system of white supremacy, which uh, Neely Fuller outlines as, uh, uh, it, it operates in like the nine known areas of human activity. Uh, the system of, of white supremacy. You know, th there, there's white supremacists, there's white people, and there's non-white people. Now, the, according to his definition. Now, these nine areas, the first area is uh, economics. White supremacy operates in economics, in education, in entertainment, in uh, labor, in law, in politics, in religion, in sex, and in war. And his, his thesis is, and I, and I agree with him, is that the, the, you know, the system of white supremacy needs to be uprooted and replaced with a system of justice. Um, and one, one last thing I'd like to add about uh, quote unquote white people, the work of Theodore W. Allen, where he talks about how, uh, he, he has a two volume set of books called The Invention, the Invention of White People. And he talks about how uh, the so-called quote-unquote white race is a um, ruling class social formation used to uh, keep non-white and so-called white people from uniting and uh, bringing about change. It's, it, it's driven by the ruling class, this whole idea about whiteness, where the white people, the rich white people, cut some white people in on the deal and gave them a few privileges and this, that, and the other. So um, these, these privileged white people keep, help keep the damn system in place. Sorry, uh, help keep the system in place. And that's all, uh, thank you. That's all I want to share. Thank you very much, Mr. Leona. May I call your attention to the, for those of you who may not be aware of this. Leona is calling our attention to something that's developed over the last 20, 25 years, and that is the study of whiteness in America, a very necessary study that we have taken for granted over the years. One of the earliest pieces of research and writing along those lines is still worth looking at and reading if you get a chance to in the midst of all of your busyness as students and faculty. But that first early attempt to get at this question of what is being white about? It's called How the Irish Became White. Well worth looking at. How the Irish Became White. Look at it, and next time I come, tell me what you have seen. Okay, anything else that you want to say about your attendance or non-attendance at the State of the Union? Yes, please. Yes, my name is Emerson Sheffy. I didn't get it. My name is Emerson Sheffy. Emerson, thank you, welcome. I was born in Ashtabula, Ohio, raised in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, my mother's name is Sally Liggins, and my her mother's name was Lena. Both and where was she being raised? Whitfield, Virginia. Okay. And I'd just like to comment, uh, they made some comments about the drone attacks. I didn't watch the State of the Union because uh, the game was on. Aha, all right. Emerson, thank <laughs> you, thank you for that admission because you've got lots of sisters and brothers around here. Oh, but go ahead. But I, I did comment on some blogs that I've seen about the drone attacks and about Americans dying. And it's my belief that if there are traitors to this country, there are, and they die in, the, in an attack on those, you know, if they're Americans, then that's what happens. And, mm -hmm. the, and the people who die around them, that's collateral damage. Okay. And in war, there's always collateral damage. Okay, Emerson, let me just hold you for a second there, because I think this is a very important uh, kind of dialogue. Traitors, powerful word. What judicial body 
determine that they are traitors? I'm sorry, I missed it. What judicial body in, in a society that's supposed to be based on law and justice, when you call somebody a traitor, that must mean that you have some evidence that can be shared with the public as to why this person is a traitor. And I'm asking what evidence, what judicial body in a democratic society do we have to make that judgment? Secondly, and I hope that you'll handle both of them and that we'll have a helpful time engaged in the dialogue. If you have traitors running around who have been determined to be traitors, and you have determined that you have the right to kill them, are you then also saying to the children of the traitors, little boy, little girl, don't run with your daddy. Is that what you're suggesting by the word collateral damage? Somebody's babies who happen to be with their father? Again. Does collateral damage adequately Describe who they are? In, in, in technical terms, yes. To oh, the but we don't want to be technical. We want to be human. Uh, in, 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 but there's, I, I can't, in, in, from, in my opinion, I can't go past the technical. Because in any situation, if, if, if gang violence in the street, you know, the, the ga a gang member may not be trying to shoot a particular person, but that, that was collateral damage, and I'm, and I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for the loss of the American who was coined a traitor for his child who died in the collateral damage. But in, in any, when the uh, Al Qaeda came to the United States and, 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 and in their opinion was doing what they thought was a war against the United States when they ran into the mm -hmm. World Trade Center, that was, they were killing. Um, uh, soldiers, mm -hmm. or but that most Americans, well, if you want to say that was collateral damage, mm -hmm. those Americans who died in the World Trade Center. It, it happens. I mean, you know, we, we don't talk about the soldiers who kill, I mean, who, you know, people may die innocently um, in war. You know, we talk about a drone because it's, it's not um, operated, it was operated by a human, but there's no human interaction. They can say, okay, but it's just a unmanned plane, but it's done remotely, and they can see what's going on. But that's, that's a part of war, or it's a part of making this country secure. And, you know, I, I don't, it's easy to say, you know, X, Y, and Z based on this, but if something else happens to this country, people will be up in arms. Well, you know, we need to do something. And so it happened, if these three people were, by the intelligence community, were coined as traitors, you know, I don't know what judicial body said they were traitors, but if it was the intelligence community, rather the CIA, DIA, NSA, whoever. Those experts. Those experts. If they call, I mean, you know, they could say Emerson Sheffy's a traitor. That right, they, very it, easily. It happened very easily, but it could happen. But I mean, and that's the, that's the chance I would have to take. Okay. But however, you know, if you're funding Al-Qaeda, like John Lindell, for example, if he's, if he's over there training with Al-Qaeda and he died in the, and he died in a, um, a raid done by the Navy SEALs, for example. Are we going to be up in arms because he died and he was training with Al-Qaeda? That's just my opinion. It, okay. it, it's collateral damage, and if, they, if they're Americans and they trade against this country. Okay, Emerson, I am so glad that you're willing to take the chance of just standing out there and saying what you think and what you believe. Because that, it seems to me, is the mark of a democratic society when we're ready to say where we stand and at the same moment listen to where others are standing. And as you were speaking, I kept hearing our brother Martin King saying, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth leads us to a blind and toothless generation. 
What you saying? That's all right. We can keep working. That's what we're supposed to do. We, are, we the people, are supposed to keep wrestling with this stuff and not leave it to experts. We must become experts. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> How do you get ready, Emerson? I, I don't know. I think I think if we found out some of the secrets, we, we may be more up in arms. But uh -huh. but but who the, as a collective? I'm not. I don't care to know all the secrets. If if as long as my child can be safe and go to school and learn and have the freedom that she has, we got to do what we got to do. That's, I mean, I'm speaking for mm -hmm. Emerson. I'm not speaking yes, for the collective. Yes. Yes. But. So if, if things are going rather, rather covertly, you know, the black ops operation, there's a lot of things that go on that we don't know nothing about. And that you're saying we don't want to know about. And that we don't want to know about. Because we might have to become responsible people then. Or, or, no, I don't, responsible or, or, or will we come, become more outraged and more violent. Yes. Because, so, I mean. Yes, and nobody wants to go around being outraged all the time. No. But that was the way that slavery was ended. Right, but th but that's that's slavery. Not we're we're so called free now. So there's, I think to, I, I, good, I'm gonna make a distinction between good, good, good. Please, please keep wrestling. Unfortunately, we're not gonna just have all the time that we need for it. But whatever time you can get, keep wrestling. And one of the beautiful things to wrestle with is the very title of this gathering that Brother Andy put together from slavery to freedom. Because now we must ask, what are we free for? What are we free for? To shut our eyes and ears to the suffering of the beat up and the collaterals? Or is there something else that we're meant to be about? And I hope that unless you have to run to dinner someplace, that when this is over, you and I can at least touch each other and feel that we are both deeply concerned human beings. I certainly want to look into your eyes, and I can't see them close enough from here. So when it's over, jump me, OK? <laughs> All right, good, good. Um, my name is Gary Wood, and Where I am. Gary? You can't see me because I'm way up here. I'll come down. See, Gary, that's why we were telling I you know, to come but down. See, the problem was I wasn't planning on saying anything. And then, <laughs> okay. You know, because I don't like to talk. That's why I try not to come to these things because I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut. Okay. And, well, we're glad you're failing. So now Go I ahead. failed to do so, and so now I'm going to say something. Uh, let's see. My name is Gary Wood, and I grew up basically in Flint, Michigan, where I was born. Uh, my mother's name was Bessie, or is Bessie. My grandmother's name was Beulah. Uh, she was born in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and came north sometime in the 20s. And um, I think that answered everything you wanted to know about that. And what you do around these parts? Oh, I just hang around. Okay. I, I just hang around. But what I, what I, but what I want to say is I didn't I didn't see the State of the Union also um, because I had tickets to see Sister Act that night, and after Sister Act I probably could have caught part of it, but um, the basketball game was on, so I, you know I, you know, yeah. But I you know I caught what was being said and. You know, and two things I want to don't want to respond to. One is this whole drones thing. I mean, I guess I don't know enough about it to feel that what the president is doing is right or wrong. But I do know this much: if an American was deemed to be a threat to this country, and that type of tactic was taken to eliminate him, and the collateral damage was children on our soil, people would be outraged. I think the reason that we may not have that sense of outrage is because we're not experiencing it. It's not our children, or, you know, well, let me put it this way. 
it's not children we identify as ours. Mm, oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so that's the one thing I want to say, and I, that's, that's all I'll say on that. The other thing I want to say, I've lived around long enough now that I've, I guess I can call myself an old man. I'm not as old as some, but I'm older than a lot. <laughs> and I want to live, I want to live to one day hear someone say, we need to raise the minimum wage so that poor people in this country have a better shot and not have businesses say, oh, that's going to break my back. That's all. OK, thank you, Gary. And of course, Gary, you did, if you were looking later on or listening later on, your president did say that we must raise the minimum wage. That's what I'm I know. And therefore, when you start to hear the response from people who say their back will be broken, that's the point at which all the Garys, whatever their age, are going to have to insert themselves and say, what shall we do about this for the poor? Thank you very much, Gary. Did I see some other hands who want to come in? I'm right here. Hello. Gotcha. OK. Uh, my name is Cristian Ramirez. I am a first year graduate student in the Chicano Latino Studies program. Good. I was uh, born in Saltillo, Coahuila, Mexico. And I was raised in Corpus Christi, Texas. And now I'm here. So um, my question to you today is, as the racial and ethnic demographic shift in the US, how can we begin to conceptualize terminology like minority? Okay. And the reason I ask that is because I am situated within the social sciences who use that terminology yes. every day yes. in my classrooms, in my text, and I don't wake up as a minority. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> my brother, I did not get your first name. Christian. 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 Christian, that is, a, for me, one of the most important political and psychological issues that we need to keep working on. Every time I hear minority, and this is a matter of being older again, I hear Lyndon Johnson. I hear Lyndon Johnson at that period in our country's life, the late 60s, when black young men and women, but particularly young men, were bursting out all over the country in fire. And Lyndon Johnson said, you Negro leaders, need to talk to your people and remind them that they are a minority in this country. Now, for me, that was a threat. And on a deep level, that language can continue to be a threat even though it is said by the greatest social scientists in the world. Not only is it a threat, but in, as you know, Christian, in 2013, it is a lie. And it is important that those of us who grew up calling ourselves minorities and those who grew up calling us minorities have to stop lying and have to develop a new maturity that recognizes that over time, history changes many, many situations, and that is going on right now in our country. For me, one of the most basic responses, Christiane, is to begin to ask, and now, who am I? And
and who are you? Could we speak of ourselves now as a developing new majority in America? Now that's a tricky one because psychologically on many levels it is easier to be a minority. Your only job is to complain. <laughs> but if you recognize that in a democratic nation, you are becoming the new majority, then you must become creative and must ask, what is the country that I want to help build to replace the country that has failed me in so many ways? And that, it seems to me, is an absolutely necessary task that those of us who are part of the new majority and those who are part of the old majority must be asking, must be wrestling with, because the question is, what shall the new America be like? What shall it be about? Some, some classes ought to be offered here on the subject matter of the new America. What is it like? By the way, let me suggest something that might be helpful on those lines. There is a fascinating book by a fascinating woman that some of you have probably heard of named Marian Williamson. She's written all kinds of creative, thoughtful things most of them going finally to the life of the deep inner spirit. And she has a book, the title of which is simply Imagine. I would strongly recommend it. The subtitle is What Can America Be Like in the 21st Century? Go and look for it because every great new creation begins with someone imagining that which does not yet exist and not being afraid to live for that, work for that, and die for that. So I would like to encourage you, and Christiane, for me, the big question then is not just what language shall we use now, but the big question is how shall we live out our new situation? My assumption is we have seen enough of old, terrible, distorting ways of being a majority. We've lived under that for a long, long time. Now, as we become a new majority, is there a new way that we will define what it means to be a majority in America. Is it just to get whatever we want in any way that we want it? Or is there any other level of responsibility that being a new majority involves? Christiane, let me tell you about something. By the way, is Wallene Dotson here? Not this evening. Well, I'll tell you a story that she told us this morning, Christiane. We were talking about the tremendous diversity that is represented in this country that is frightening to some people, but is absolutely nurturing to others. I include myself among those. She talked about being at last month this is still February, right? Last month's inaugural event and the parade especially. And she talked about sitting near a family that was talking in Spanish constantly with one another. And there was a little girl who looked like she was maybe about five or six years old just watching all of the floats and all the marching bands until she saw the Chinese group 
that came. Did, do some of you remember that? Seeing the, the folks uh, from the West Coast who came representing the Chinese community and just doing magnificent movements, playing wonderful instruments, and the little girl just sat and looked, and then she simply shouted out, Oh, que lindo! How beautiful. And to have a society where a little girl can see something that we would call, in many cases, strange, and instead be able to shout out, how beautiful, in Spanish, is one of the great hopes that I have for the direction that this country might be able to go with a new majority. You want to take one more comment and then wrap it up? Vince, I think you have some. Did she give it up? Oh, no, she's standing up. Okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Just, just one more. Remind us about your name, and <laughs> you were talking to us about the dolls. Is that right? No, she was. I was. Two more. Okay, so we've got two more. Okay. 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 I'm Carrie L. Owens. I was born and reared in West Palm Beach, Florida. My mother was Hattie Mae uh, Butler Lewis, and she was born and reared in Sylvania, Georgia. My grandmother was Lily Carey. Uh, Butler Lewis, <laughs> and she was also born and reared in Sylvania, Georgia. Uh, I did hear the State of the Union message, and I was amazed that not much have changed in the last four years. Uh, I feel that when President Obama made his first State of the Union message, uh, he tried him, his best to get bipartisan cooperation, which he never got, and sometimes I feel that the media is the most destructive force in our country. They do pundits, they say things before they get the information. And I feel that many people watch the network media and they don't always have the right information. And the president <laughs> has lots of advisors, uh, he gets a lot of different information, sometimes it's not always right. And I guess I agree with Gary sometimes that if, if it's going to keep our country safe, you know, I don't want to know everything. And because the enemies are listening too, and they know everything, but somehow the media think that we have to know everything. And uh, for uh, Patrick and also the other lady that spoke, you know, when you have these concerns, uh, uh, email the president, call him, write him, and he will respond to you. I've done lots of that with education, <laughs> and uh, I guess you wonder what I'm doing in Michigan. <laughs> well, I had better job opportunities in Michigan than I had in Florida. I was teaching under the same segregated conditions that I went to school under, which were just really atrocious. You know, we were robbed of, of everything. And I feel, I, I still have a lot of hope. I feel that, uh, uh, President Obama, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, that was just after he was elected because of the eight years that we had spent under George Bush. And the whole nation was discouraged. And therefore, he got that right then, right after that. And, and, and sure, he acknowledges that he's made many mistakes. He's made many mistakes. He tried to correct them. But he is just one person. And if you read and you uh, listen to some of the other networks like MSNBC and some of the other works that, that search out facts, they search out facts before they give out information, then you would see that he's done the best he could to try to get bipartisan cooperation. He could have uh, uh, walked all over the Congress when he had the majority in the House and Senate, but he didn't do that. He still tried. And I guess I still have hope. I think that each person, in order to change and get a new society, each person must look inside of himself and see, you know, what have I contributed to the hatred and the racism and the bigotry that's going on. I think it's worse now than it's ever been. And I, and I contribute that a lot to the social and the network media. It's, it's, it's really bad. It's, it's really bad. Sister Carey, <laughs> let me thank you for that. And at the same moment, keep coming to the theme 
we the people. Amen. Our job is to counter whatever we see as evil, as destructive to democracy in America. Mm -hmm. Our job is not simply to criticize the president or to praise the president, mm -hmm. president but for us to take on the work of creating that more perfect union. And I'd like to encourage you not to lose hope and not even to apologize about being hopeful. We will have nothing for our children's children unless some of us are hopeful enough to keep the struggle going on. I think it's very, very important that you stay at the level that you are, keep learning what you're learning, and one thing, please do not give in. Do not give in to the idea that in order for our country to be safe, we have to make other people unsafe. Amen. There is something very non-human about that. So keep working, keep working with that. As you can see, I've been instructed that we have to close off because I'm almost as old as Andy. I close off a little slowly. And I'd like to hear about the dolls. Okay, good. And, I, and thank you. And I just want to validate you for this kind of forum because I think it's very important for us to continue to learn. And I have a lot of hope. I pray for the senators and representatives every night, every day, that God will touch their hearts so they will get some of the hatred and the bigotry and the racism out of their hearts. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. My Where's name, our doll announcer? I'm, I'm here with the dolls. Yes. And it is a critical issue. And I'm glad that you've allowed me to do this because it really is at the forefront of everybody's minds. But now My you... name is Suzanne Elms Barclay. I was a civil engineer. My mother was born in Phoenix, Arizona. Her mother told me that she was, her mother was French. I am pleased to tell you all that I am non-white. My grandmother's mother was named Lopez. My grandmother was married my grandfather who was one of the nastiest bigots I ever met in my life. And my mother consequently never got to meet her grandmother Lopez, great-grandmother Lopez, who lived until my mother was 11 years old. And I've been able to tell my mother this. I also have my one drop. Uh, these two, two lovely ladies over here know my granddaughter, Carissa, who is the pride of my life, and she is uh, a, a person which in the olden days you'd call mixed or biracial, and she is the love of my life. And I also have two sons from Korea, who one of whom is in my basement, and that does not make him the love of my life. <laughs> All right, the dolls. Um, I was raised also in Newport Beach, in Wellesley Hills, in Inglewood, in Indian Hills, and the first black person I ever spoke to was when I was 16 years old. The high school I went to, um, we had to put in our pictures, and they allowed one very lovely young lady from Florida whose family was very well-to-do, black woman, and then a young lady from Kenya. And those were the two black people I spoke to besides the guy with a blinker going across Arizona. But that's a great story, but I won't go there. Because we have Thank to talk you. about Thank the dolls. You. The dolls. Yesterday morning, in the Lansing State Journal, there is an article, which when I read it at first, it began of joy to my heart. Because here's some, another white person wanting to give equal opportunity to dolls of color. There was a white doll for sale and a black doll for sale. The white doll was $21, the black doll was $13. This woman was a white woman. She went to the Civil Rights Commission. She made a big old sink at Meyer, who happened to be white people. Um, and in the end, sadly, my, I was crushed that this, the darling woman bought a white doll. She was just trying to get the white doll for the black doll price. She didn't care about the black dolls. I'm shocked to tell you. But I wrote a very 
I hope somebody finds, it's supposed to be published in the next couple of days, very, I think, amusing that I was so excited that the Dolls of Color were finally going to get their due. But this is the point, I, I don't, my mouth is all dry. This is the point. On the blogs, and these are people that are called top bloggers, and of course I couldn't help myself, top commenters, because they said this woman should get a life. They say people shouldn't talk about race. We're tired of talking about race. I click on their Facebook pictures, and gosh, they're white, they live out in, you know, and none of their friends seem to be people of color. So what I have done with my life, and I want you to tell me, because I sure still look white, don't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm going to get a tattoo Never or Never sorry. Be sorry about I, who well, you I, are. You know, that one lady was, was tr so true. I mean, my family came over on the damn Mayflower. But I'm what sorry. Were you, what were you going to say? Okay, what I'm going to say is that I believe, contrary to what these white people are saying, that if white people do not stand up against racism in other white people, they can't say, get over it. They can't say, get a life. Why does everybody have to pull up the race card? I believe that my, whatever I have to do in the next, you know, I, I have to live to 128 to get everything done. But my feeling is that it is my absolute reason for living is when someone try, looks at me and tells some, me something that's inappropriate, that I should respond and say, that's inappropriate. I might look white to you, but I'm going to tell you about history. I'm going to tell you about what has happened in this country. And, um, and if people think that's a stupid thing for me to do, because I'm, I'm not with a black person, oh, I have to help this poor black person stand up for herself. I'm doing it all on my own. Susan? Suzanne. Suzanne? My, my mom would correct you. Okay, Suzanne, thank you. I'm going to make great use of your comment to close out with okay. hold on and, and, and hold, I will get hold on a second hold okay. on a second dear ones All right. one of the things that we're trying to figure out here as we work together is how do we relate to each other's passion how do we relate to each other's boredom? How do we relate to each other? And we're going to figure our way through this one because doing this is absolutely necessary to the future of our country. Let me start with Suzanne's uh, comment. Thank you. I am absolutely convinced that in this strange and paradoxical way that the future of this country depends on white people dealing with other white people. This is a very important matter. There are some white people who I will never be able to speak to, even though I've spent much of my life speaking to white people. There are some white people that only you can speak to, including your grandmamas and uncles and sisters and coworkers. And I would like to commission you to let your whiteness become not a privilege, but a commission to go on and do the work with white people that needs to be done. And you know it at least as well as I do what that work is. That's one part of my three-part closing, okay? Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to speak because one, only one other person under 35 spoke and specifically called for it. <laughs> See, you're starting trouble just before you even identify yourself. 
Um, my name is Alexandra Gelbard. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology. I was, I, um, my childhood was spent in La Paz, Bolivia and Washington, D.C. And my grandmother, whose name is uh, Dertu Hanula, was a first generation from Finland, grew up in Seattle. Um, I wanted to talk to you, or wanted to mention today that following up on our conversation at lunch about civility and how do we teach civility to our young people, what it means, I'm sorry, not civility, citizenship, that makes more sense. How do we teach our young people to be active citizens in our society in a day where free speech is taken for granted and rather than have, you know, rather than having free truth, we have free, spree, free speech where Anyone can say anything they like, regardless of its merit or validity. Um, I've been thinking about our conversation earlier on citizenship and education, and some of the things that were mentioned were um, knowing our history and knowing our history holistically. Um, I mentioned you know, socializing empathy into yes. our young people. Um, but along with that is a symptom of entitlement that our youth in this generation um, below me and you know, in that kind of 27 and under period have embodied as an ethos and as a consciousness. And it goes to the fact of materialism and all of these symptoms that are corroding our society and corroding our world. Um, one of the you know, blatant examples that showed up yesterday in the news cycle was the release of a single by the rapper Lil Wayne um, where he evoked the memory of Emmett Till um, in reference to violating a woman um, sexually. And you know, Twitter exploded on that, and Dr. Anthea Butler was very vocal in her expression of outrage, as I'm sure we all are. Um, but it's very symptomatic of the under and miseducation of our youth generations, um, myself included. Tell and me your name again now. Alexandra Gelbard. Alexandra, mm -hmm. I'd like you to try to gather the essence now of what you want to finally say mm -hmm. with us because I've got to listen mm -hmm. to these folks up here, okay? So what I'm sorry, um, so what I'm trying to say is that um, as someone who is a part of the youth and I've watched the youth steadily trickled out today, which I also think is symptomatic, um, we need to figure out a way of communicating across these generational lines and communicating and socializing and as a young man mentioned earlier, nourishing our youth inside of a consciousness of knowing our history and knowing the truth and taking responsibility for that. Okay. So for us to struggle with how to go about doing that and to keep that in our heads. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, Andrea. And here, here is what I'd like to close out with. Andrea was, Alexandra was referring to a question that I was asking at noontime. And that is, in the light of our need, for deeply engaged democratic citizens. How do we include the development of such citizens in our formal and informal educational settings? How do we begin to help create democratic citizens who will understand what we the people are about? Alexandria, I want to give you, as my closing, two sources of great encouragement that I received this afternoon about people who are working just on that task. One is a sister who came here from overseas, from India. She has an eight-year-old daughter. She said one of the ways in which she deals with that matter of helping to prepare her daughter for democratic citizenship is simply to take her with her when she goes to vote. And the conversations they begin to have out of that are just fantastic. And then when she takes her back to school and is to met at the door by the teacher or the principal who wants to know where she was, another wonderful opportunity for teaching. Uh, goes on. That was of great interest to me. The second uh, source of encouragement was from a young brother from Dubai. Are you here, by the way, from Dubai, who spoke earlier today? Okay, here, here is what he said. This was of great 
interest to me. He said when he first came to this country, he was just a teenager, and he assumed that he needed to know something about the country that he was coming to. And he was asking people for help into what he should read, what he should study, in order to be a new citizen in this country. And it ended up with his reading 50 or 60 books of American history as a part of his preparation. I could just imagine what it would be like to make something like that part of our teaching in every ho household, in every kindergarten, in every junior high school, a set of readings that would help people to know what does it mean to be an American and who made this way for us and what was the price that they had to pay. For me, that is the reason why we go to take the time to explore from slavery to freedom. I'm really glad that you all are ready, and I think you are now, to engage in that question that is ultimately the question that I spoke about at the very beginning. Now, what is freedom for? And how shall we carry it out? And obviously, part of freedom is the freedom to shout out and say, hey, listen to me. How to do that and to be civil at the same time, I don't know. But that's all right. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you so much, Vincent, and thank all of you for coming. I do have a proclamation, but let me also publicly thank the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine, Bill Strample, without whom the series would not continue. He gives its, its unqualified support. And let me also thank Sandy Kilborn, wherever she is, and Barbara B. Love. These are the people that make me look good. We do have a proclamation. Thank all of them, please. And a proclamation, and this is from the state legislature and uh, I imagine the instigator was Gretchen, Gretchen Whitner, who is a strong supporter of the college. But others are signed here by Ann Shore and Samar Singh and Tom Cochran. The special tribute signed and dedicated to the honor of Dr. Vincent Harding for his outstanding commitment and service to the citizens of this great nation. So we thank you, Vince, for being here. And please accept this <laughs> proclamation. Also, a week after next, week after next, we'll have, um, we'll have, uh, tell me who we have. Oh, Jim Lawson, Jim Lawson, one of the original Freedom Riders. So I know all of you will love to hear him and the things that he has to tell us about the struggles that he went through. And what I've been hearing throughout this series is truth to power, truth to power, and what is real. So thank you again for coming and look forward to seeing you week after next. Thank you.